My name is Sanjay Gupta, I'm a consultant cardiologist in York and today's video is on the subject of aspirin. Now in my last video I decried the overzealous prescription of medications which may have no or very limited benefit for the patient. In this video I wanted to explore this further with respect to aspirin which is commonly prescribed for prevention or treatment of heart disease. This video is enigmatically entitled Welcome to the Primary Bank of Aspirin. I'll explain this. Now, the best banks to put your money in are those which keep your money safe and give you a good return on your investment. In the same sense, the best medications to take are those that are both safe, but also in the long term offer a substantial return in terms of either improving quality of life or an improvement in length of life. If we think about it, if a medication will not improve our quality of life or our length of life, then there's no reason to take it. Assessing the return in terms of quality of life is relatively easy because you, the individual, can measure your quality of life and work out whether a medication has improved your quality of life or not. Length of life, however, is much more difficult because as an individual, you will never know whether a medication has prolonged your life or not. So the only way to decide whether a medication offers good returns is to look at data that has been accrued from studies of patients just like you and use those data to decide whether the returns from taking that medication are good enough um, for us to invest in that medication or not. If we think about it, this is how we decide to invest our money in a bank. We do our research to ensure that our capital will be safe and we look at the rates of interest we would get before parting with our hard-earned cash. Unfortunately, we rarely do the same with medications. Um, we just take the medications because the doctor tells us it is good for us. We rarely ever ask, how good? And the incredible thing is that this answer to this question, how good, should be easily available because all quantitative research is about using numbers to tell us how good something is. And yet rarely are we given the number by our doctor to help us make our decision. Imagine trying to put money in a bank and not knowing what kind of interest you'll get. You wouldn't be, feel comfortable about putting your money in such a bank. Uh, but we're happy taking medications when doctors are not uh, easily volunteering information about how good the medication is. Trying to get numbers even though it may seem relatively straightforward, is anything but easy because the numbers that really matter are often concealed in complex statistics, complex wording, relative percentages, etc., rather than being completely transparent. In that sense, it is far easier to get numbers from bankers than it is from the pharma industry. Now, in this video, I wanted to try and get those numbers and put them out in front of you so that you can decide for yourselves whether the numbers are good enough to justify your investment in a particular medication. As always, I would like to stress that please do not make any changes to your medications without speaking with your own healthcare provider, as the information I present here may not be applicable to your unique situation. So today, I welcome you to the primary bank of aspirin. This is called the primary bank because it is only for those people who have never had a heart attack or a stroke, but are looking to prevent one from happening by taking a daily aspirin. This video is not for those patients who have already had a heart attack or a stroke or stents or bypasses or some other form of vascular event who are trying to prevent a further event by taking aspirin. For those people, there exists the secondary bank of aspirin, which I shall talk about in a later video. So if you've never had a cardiac event or a stroke, the primary bank of aspirin is the bank that you need to know about. So let's firstly consider why are we even talking about aspirin? And the answer is that aspirin is an antiplatelet agent and we know that the majority of vascular events occur because of sudden formation of blood clots within the blood vessels. And therefore taking an agent which stops platelets aggregating together and forming a blood clot would seem like a great idea. But the question is, whilst that may be a great idea, what does reality tell us? What kind of returns do people get on their investment in a daily dose of aspirin? The question is, does aspirin prevent death or vascular events such as heart attacks or strokes if you have never had previous history of vascular events? And there have been some big trials trying to answer this. 
there was a trial called ASCEND, A-S-C-E-N-D. If you do a Google search, you'll find it quite easily. In this study, over 15,000 patients with diabetes but no history of a cardiac or vascular event were assigned to aspirin or placebo, and they were followed up for an average of 7.4 7 years. And at the end of the trial, if you just counted up the numbers of deaths in both groups without trying to work out why these patients died, we find that 748 out of 7,740 people died in the aspirin group and 792 out of 7,740 people died in the placebo group. And statistically, this was not considered a real significant difference, i.e. this could have happened just by chance. So the conclusion was that aspirin does not prevent you dying. So the next question was, was it that the aspirin had no benefit at all, or was it that in some way it did have some benefit, but the benefit was eroded by some harm from the aspirin? And when we look at this more closely, we see that yes, aspirin use is associated with a 12% reduction in vascular events compared to placebo but that benefit was offset by a 29% increase in major bleeding. And therefore, in conclusion, there was really no net benefit at all from aspirin in this group of people who have never had a vascular event in the, in the past. Another study looking at this was called ASPRE, A-S-P-R-E-E. -E. Here, over 19,000 patients were studied. These patients were above the age of 70. They were given either aspirin or placebo. And after an average of 4.7 years, there was found that there was no difference in major cardiac or vascular events between the two groups. But again, there was an excess of bleeding in the aspirin group. Interestingly, more people died in the aspirin group compared to placebo, but most of these patients died of cancer. This doesn't, the, there wasn't enough to, be con to make any kind of conclusions about this, but uh, it's, it is important to um, just bear that in mind that certainly, you know, aspirin did not prevent deaths in these people. There was another study called ARRIVE, and in ARRIVE there were 12,000 odd patients, men above the age of 55, women above the age of 60, and they found that at the end of five years there was no difference in cardiovascular events between the two groups. So as these were different studies looking at different populations, a group of statisticians decided to combine all the data together to try and work out the overall benefit and overall harm from aspirin. If you want to see the numbers for yourself, please visit a website called www.thenntheenfornovembernovembertforango.com -E and type in aspirin for primary prevention of cardiovascular disease. And these scientists have done some amazing work and produced some numbers for us to look at and these numbers will then allow us to work out what our return on investment will be with aspirin. These numbers are called the numbers needed to treat. I, how many people are, need to take the medication and for how long to prevent one event, be that death or a heart attack or a stroke? The numbers needed to treat for aspirin are as follows. Aspirin does not prevent death compared to placebo in patients who have never had a vascular event previously. You would have to treat 2,000 patients for one year to prevent one non-fatal heart attack, and you would have to treat 3,000 patients for one year to prevent one non-fatal stroke. For every 3,333 patients who take aspirin, there will be a major bleed in one patient. So overall, when you combine all these data, you would have to treat 1,667 patients on aspirin for one year, for one person, somewhere, someone somewhere to benefit. Most importantly, no one, including that person themselves, will ever know the identity of that beneficiary. So in summary, the returns on your investment from the primary bank of aspirin can be thought of as follows using a banking analogy put £1,667 in the bank for one year for it to earn £1 worth of interest and there is no guarantee at all that you will even receive that £1. I now leave it up to you to decide whether that is an investment worth making or not.
I hope you found this video useful and I would love to hear your comments. Thank you so much for all the kind support. I'm going to do a video again in the in near future. I've had some really difficult times on a personal note and I'll probably share all that with you uh, as time progresses. Take care. All the best.